Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Welcome back to the Nano Hub U course, Thermal Energy at the Nano Scale. I'm Tim Fisher from Purdue. And today we're going to talk about electron density of states. We're in chapter or week two, uh, which is also chapter two of the accompanying textbook. And we'll talk about uh, electrons today. In the last lecture, we talked about phonons and derived their density of states. Um, for both electrons and phonons, uh, density of states is a concept that we will use repeatedly when we uh, when we start to look at transport problems. So it's it's a very important. Um, part of the of the overall uh, study of, of phonons and electrons. So as we had mentioned at the beginning of this week, electrons obey the Fermi-Dirac statistics, so they're different than the statistics that govern phonons. And the distribution function is F, and you see that uh, in this case we have a plus one in the denominator. The only difference between Bose-Einstein statistics, which are valid for phonons and photons, and uh, Fermi-Dirac statistics uh, is this plus or minus sign in the denominator. So it's a very subtle difference uh, mathematically, uh, but in the, or at least uh, in terms of uh, a single sign, uh, but in terms of the numerical values, uh, they can be quite different. We also have um, uh, our, an electron wave vector, K, and so what we're going to want to do is relate this wave vector k to the energy states and then so that's the the equivalent of having a dispersion relation um, and so we we want to have one of those for electrons like we had them for phonons and once we have those two things together we can talk about about how many states are available in a given energy range that's really what the the density of states is about the most common dispersion approximation for electrons is the so-called parabolic band approximation. And so here we have uh, essentially that the energy is proportional to the momentum squared. And if you, if you actually back out uh, momentum and, and express it instead of in the quantum uh, sense of h bar times k, if we express that as mass times velocity, you'll notice that this looks like the kinetic energy equation, E equals one-half mv squared. And so that's what we, we will use for our general approximations for electron dispersion. And I think it's important that you, you appreciate the fact that it, it's, it can be quite different. The, the, the realistic band structure can be quite different in a couple of major ways. First of all, for semiconductors, the bands are not typically parabolic throughout the energy space. But at least at the bottom of these of the bands, they can look, their curvature looks like it's parabolic. And in semiconductors also, even if it is, even if the parabolic assumption is reasonable, we still often have to make another change, essentially, because the band structure is not shaped the same way that it is for free electrons. It is parabolic, but the curvature is different. And so what we do in those cases is replace the uh, m sub e, which is the electron mass, that's the electron rest mass, which you can look up. Uh, we replace that with an effective mass that's really a band curvature parameter. So if we plot this parabolic energy profile, um, here what we've done, just so that it's very clear is we've we've actually said the bottom of this conduction band and this could still be a metal if the Fermi level is up inside the band but the bottom of the conduction band is down here so we've we've made that approximation it's at 0.5 and I've normalized also the energy in this case so that we don't have to worry so much about units in general you should worry about units but but if we normalize them out then then we can talk about the physics more than units and you'll see that we take this shape, this curve takes a nice parabolic shape. That's mathematically how we've defined it. And what we'd like to do is to relate the density of states, or, or relate the wave vector to, uh, to energy. And in doing so, what we want to do is, is create a relationship between those two things that we can use, for example, when we have an integral 
in K space, in wave vector space, and we want to convert it to energy space, this density of states is going to be, become important. And so I often, students often ask, you know, what, what kind of density is this? And so this is really um, uh, the density of allowable states per unit energy. That's really what we're after, especially for electrons. For phonons, we described it in terms of, of frequency space instead of energy space and also wave vector space a little bit. But let's recall, first of all, that the the wave vectors, the allowed states of wave vectors, have a regular order. Now I didn't draw all the available wave vector states, but let's say that I had three that were separated by an equivalent distance in K space on the x-axis here. And again, this is a normalized wave vector. If I map those using this parabolic curve to energy space, you'll notice that in energy space those three states are much more tightly spaced uh, that relative to the states, the equivalent states where I've made the same width of band in the in K space and map those to energy space. Now I have a much broader range. Those three states occupy a much broader range in energy space um, for the high wave vectors than they do for the low wave vectors. So basically what we're saying here is that if this band, where this band has a very small slope where it's flat then I'll have a very high density of states. And where it is has a high slope, I'll have a very low density of these allowable states in energy space. So that's sort of, sort of how we think about density. It's the, the density of allowable states uh, in some space. In this case, we're, we're particularly interested in energy space. So now we go through this and we say, well, and this is very similar to what we did for phonons, we're going to describe some things a little bit differently, uh, both because it's easier for electrons to do it this way and also because you'll see it in other literature done this way. And I want to give you kind of a, uh, a few different ways of, of thinking about these different concepts. So the number of states per unit volume in K space for electrons, and this is for three dimensions, is the volume, that's the real space volume, divided by 4 pi cubed. Now, you might think, well, it should be 8 pi cubed, but if we look, look down at the, the next equation where we, where we make it more general for different dimensionalities, the factor of 2 here comes from spin degeneracy. So that's up and down spin for electrons, which we didn't have for phonons. So in general, this number of states per unit K space volume can be expressed in this very simple form. And of course, the, the 2 pi over L factor comes from the amount, the region of K space that surrounds a, uh, a given allowable mode. We also can use this, as I mentioned before, it's helpful in, uh, in some integral analysis both in transforming from uh, k-space to energy space, but also in transforming summations, such as shown here at the bottom, to integrals. And so this, in this case, the function w is just a generic function. But often we'll see when we first derive things, especially from the basic statistical mechanics, uh, we'll have summations instead of integrals. And so what we'd like to do is, is to convert those to uh, to inter integrals that we can evaluate more easily than usually than summations. And so this uh, number of states per unit volume helps us in that regard. Then we go through this and, and we're going to do it a little bit differently. We'll say here that the, the density of states, this is in energy space, is going to be that number of states per unit k-space volume, that's n, that was from the last slide. And I'm just going to divide that by the volume of the system that we're interested in. And volume could, could be true real space volume, L to the power 3. Or if I had a two-dimensional problem, it, it would be area. If I had a one-dimensional problem, it would just be length. And what we can do is march around. Another way that people think about density of states is we can, we can march around the uh, allowable, the, the energy in K space, 
and say that I have, at every point where I have an allowable state, I'll make a delta function. Now, this is a little bit more abstract than what we've done before, but what we're going to do is just sum over all of k space and we're going to add up sort of a delta function uh, that, that represents an allowable state. And of course, when I integrate over a delta function, the integral is unity. So what we have to do here, what we've done as we move down, we then apply what we had on the previous page, that uh, summation to integral conversion using the n sub k factor. We now substitute here and we do our integration in k space. So k prime is just a, a dummy variable for integration. And we'll notice that we're, we'll represent energy. Here we have made the parabolic band approximation, whereas in the first equation on this slide, uh, we haven't made that approximation yet. So what we can do, it's, it's actually pretty simple. There's a sifting property of the delta function that allows this integral actually to be, to be uh, evaluated quite easily. There's a, a couple of, of tricks mathematically that you have to do because this is a k-space integral and we actually have k squared inside the delta function. So there's a couple of things that you have to do, um, but, but they're pretty simple and straightforward. So when we actually do this evaluation for the different dimensionalities, 1D, 2D, and 3D, we find that this density of states takes on different forms, and actually markedly different forms mathematically, uh, for the different dimensionality. So in 1D, we find that, that the density of states is inversely proportional to the square root of energy. And so that might worry you. Uh, for, for many people, it does cause some issues um, in the analysis because it, when energy goes to zero, then I have a singularity. In the, in the case of a two-dimensional problem, it's actually very easy. It's a constant. The density of states is constant. There's no variation in the density of states. The k-space mapping and the density in k-space maps right into the same equivalent density in energy space. It's just a flat curve. And then finally, the one that may be more familiar to you is that for three-dimensional materials, the density of electron states is proportional to the square root of energy. And that's what a lot of people see, in the, and it's used often in uh, the analysis of electron, electronic transistors and so forth. So I want to show you this qualitatively, what this would look like. And of course, those functions on the previous page don't don't seem to correspond exactly to uh, the functions that we see here. But what, we, what we're now seeing is a collection of curves for different dimensionalities. Now, I didn't include the zero-dimensional case in the previous slide, and we really won't focus too much on zero-dimensional cases. But just for the sake of, of completeness, if I had a quantum dot, that's a zero-dimensional object, then I would have these these are true delta functions. Uh, there would be no integration in k-space uh, because k-space is, is a point. And so those delta functions are truly delta functions and we just have these, these very sharp features in the density of states. Now what are these multiple features? We only talked about kind of one curve for each dimensionality before. Well, those would be different bands and that's what, and we're, we won't worry too much about multiple bands and, and band gaps and so forth in this class. Uh, most of our interest is going to be focusing on a conduction band that's usually filled, not so much interest in semiconductor transport. Um, the other NanoHub U courses are doing wonderful things with, with that subject, and so um, we'll direct you there for those, uh, for those uh, folks who want to want more information on, on that topic. The one-dimensional materials have this singularity. So this is, let's say, the lowest energy state. And in, in electron analysis and, and kind of forming these electron uh, motive diagrams, sometimes they're called, uh, you have to pick a, a zero point for your energy. So it's somewhat arbitrary. And so let's say that the lowest energy state for the wire was right here. The lowest band was right here. I'd get this singularity and then it would slope off. That was the one over the square root of energy term. And then it hits another band and I have another singularity. These singularities are called Van Hove singularities. 
and uh, they're well known. We'll, we'll see them more in just a moment. But then we have another one over the square root of energy t type of decay term. For the quantum wells, that's the, those are two-dimensional materials. Then we have these flat curves. But then when we hit another band, we have a step function up and a step function and, and so on and so forth as we hit each additional band. And then finally, for the 3D material, that's what we'll call bulk, um, we have that square root of energy dependence of the density of states. So just to, to put this a little bit into the context of, of some modern materials of importance, um, this is what the density of states looks like for a carbon nanotube. It's a specific carbon nanotube uh, with a, uh, a certain chirality. It's a single walled carbon nanotube. Uh, it's armchair. Now we talked about the edges of graphene uh, and what was what, what people called them armchair, zigzag, and then there's some things in between. In this case you can see from this image that it is armchair as I'm, I'll trace out a little bit of that. So there's the armchair. There's the next one. And so you see that um, that this, in this case, the, the edge, the edge geometry of the atoms uh, gives you the type, at least in, in terms of uh, the, the normal vernacular armchair or zigzag. Again, we see these uh, these bands. And in this case, the density of states, the density of electron states, uh, is finite even at the what, what is an arbitrary point zero. That's actually the intrinsic Fermi level for this for this material. And so this nanotube would be metallic because it has a finite density of electron states at its Fermi level. There are some nanotubes that can be semiconductors, in which case this would act, this region in the middle around zero would, would have no a zero density of states. On the right side of the curve, we have what we would call the conduction bands. Again, we have those singularities and then the one over square root of energy decay terms as we heat as we hit each different band. And then on the left side, we have what would be called the equivalent of valence bands. Now you can actually generate a plot like this on your own. And I encourage you to do so. And you can use a, uh, the NanoHub tool. There's all kinds of wonderful tools, most of which are really easy to use. Uh, there are also some research grade codes that, uh, that really do some powerful things. But there are a lot of instructional tools on the NanoHub. In this case, I generated this plot from start to finish in probably, I would say, less than two minutes. Uh, so. Uh, they're very, very versatile and easy to use, and I, I encourage you to do that. Thank you very much, and I'll see you next time.